So we're going to begin our lecture study of the Kingdom Animalia, and we'll start with the introductory chapter that covers the diversity of the animals and how their body plans reflect their evolutionary uh, relationships, um, or can re reflect their evolutionary relationships. And so um, let's get started here. So with this section here, and on the little side video is going to be a little microscopic animal that you would need uh, magnification to see. They're called water bearers or tardigrades. Uh, but that's to highlight the fact that uh, animals are quite capable of active movement. But let's take a look at your learning outcome for this section here. And that's to identify three features that characterize all animals and uh, three that characterize only some type of animals. So first of all, all animals are heterotrophic. Um, uh, so we're chemo, organo, heterotrophic, and um, we obtain energy from organic molecules and by ingesting other organisms. So one actually characteristic most animals ingest their food. We're multicellular, which means we have uh, more than one cell type, uh, and that allows for greater uh, uh, complexity uh, in, in the, the evolution of animals. We don't have cell walls. Uh, humans are included as animals, so there's no cell walls like you see in plants and fungi get there quite capable of active movement, and they can move in uh, a lot more complex ways than uh, any other organisms that might be capable of some movement. They do uh, show a diversity of form, um, and they do very greatly um, in uh, their structure overall and uh, in their range of size. From really small, like these water bears that you see under magnification, and you see it's magnified 100 times in that video there, uh, to really large animals uh, like whales and uh, some things that have gone extinct, like dinosaurs. Uh, so some additional features for animals. First of all, uh, they have a great diversity of habitats. Many of them are aquatic and marine, uh, live in oceans, uh, but they live underground, uh, up in trees, uh, forest floor, deserts, uh, you name it, they live in all kinds of places. Uh, and uh, currently, there's between 35 and 40 recognized animal phyla. We're not going to survey that many phyla here. That would be uh, uh, an exhaustive coverage. Instead, we're going to be uh, maybe surveying about no more than 15 here in the lecture and even less in the laboratory to just kind of get an overall feel for the diversity of, of animals. Animals do sexual reproduction. Um, most are going to do that. And... Um, they're, uh, they're going to have embryonic development. They go from zygote um, and then mitosis uh, to form an embryo, which is a ball of cells. You can see an embryo in the image down here. Here's an embryo after uh, the zygote's probably divided uh, maybe four, four or five times. Uh, and animals do have tissues, and that's going to allow for more complexity and structure, uh, even... Uh, um, tissues coming together to make organs and organ systems. As you can see here, a butterfly is a, a, kind of, a kind of animal in the insects, and here we have a millipede here. And so we'll study these in more detail later. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next section here right away and the evolution of the body plan. Uh, and this one is, uh, this section's a, a bit uh, more involved here. But your goals here, your learning outcomes, are going to be to differentiate between uh, uh, pseudocelom and a coelom. These are uh, terms that reflect the internal organization uh, and uh, the ability for animals to evolve more complex organs. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And then explain the difference between protostomes and deuterostomes. That uh, is going to describe the way certain animals uh, go through development. Uh, and then you're going to describe the advantages of, of uh, something uh, uh, structurally called segmentation, where you have a repetition of body parts. So there's going to be five key innovations that uh, we see in animal evolution. First is the development of a symmetry, a body symmetry, tissues, which was already mentioned. A body cavity, which is related to coelom. Uh, the word seal means cavity. Um, and so you see that word in the root there. The patterns of development they go through, and then segmentation, which is going to be a repetition of body parts. Uh, so looking at symmetry, uh, the evolution of symmetry itself, we're going to look at very simple animals called sponges, and those don't have symmetry, so they lack that symmetry. 
uh, and they don't even have uh, tissues. They're just multicellular. They're very, very simple. And, and uh, the character SpongeBob SquarePants, uh, it's, you know, he, the cartoon has eyes, and these are, uh, eyes would be organs. The sponges don't have tissues, so they can't even have organs. So they're actually really much simpler than uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. So now all the other animals are going to have some sort of symmetry. Uh, once you get past sponges, sponges are very, very simple uh, as far as um, uh, animals go, so we might call them more primitive. Uh, so they're going to have a certain symmetry, and to uh, imagine what symmetry is, you have to look at an imaginary axis that you draw uh, through the body. Uh, and there's going to be two main types of symmetry that we see, and one is radial symmetry, uh, and the other one is bilateral symmetry. Now, we're bilaterally symmetrical, and and all that means is that uh, you can only divide the body one way, and you get mirror images of that. And that's when you divide the body into right and left halves. Uh, and that's done on a plane. You can see this, this sea turtle here. This is the head end right here, and this is the tail end, and this is the back end, the dorsal side, and then the belly side is the ventral side. So if you run what's called a sagittal plane, and the, the long axis of the body is where that plane would run. If you run that, uh, uh, if you if you slice the body in half there along this plane, the sagittal plane they call it, it's called a sagittal section, that's when you get that bilateral symmetry. If you try to cut it along other planes, like the frontal plane here, or a transverse plane, which cuts into the top and bottom parts of the animal, the front and back, you don't get that bilateral symmetry. For radial symmetry, the body parts seem to radiate uh, around uh, 360 degrees around the main axis. So here, we're actually looking at the top part of the sea anemone. Most people became very familiar with sea anemones uh, after, um, or they became more aware of them after that uh, animated movie, Finding Nemo, because clownfish live uh, along sea anemones. And so this is what it would look like from the side here. The body is, uh, they're, they're stuck, they, they don't move around very much, so they're sometimes referred to as sessile. And they have these tentacles that they have stinging cells for, and then they have a mouth up here on top. And my point here is, is that uh, if we draw uh, uh, imaginary axis down um, uh, the length of this, of the body of this animal, and there's your axis. And if we look from above, so let's say your eyes are, this is your eye, and your eye is up here, and you're looking down at the animal here. And that's what we're doing here. That's what this image is. This is the top view. And so we look down there and we run a plane and we slice the animal. There are several ways you can slice it and you still get um, uh, symmetries. You still get mirror images. And it's those tentacles are radiating all the way around there. So that's referred to as radial symmetry. And this is actually a good adaptation for animals that don't move very much because they can sense and scan and pick up food from 360 degrees around them. So. Uh, there's a, uh, a functional benefit to that kind of uh, symmetry for animals that are, uh, as I said, sessile. They don't move very much, uh, very little or not at all. They actually can actually change the location uh, uh, as well. So uh, the other kind is bilateral symmetry. And with bilateral symmetry, which is like us humans and this shark here and the sea turtle, uh, one thing that corresponds with bilateral symmetry is a tendency for the nervous system uh, to be arranged where there's a high concentration of nerve tissue towards the head end and the sensory organs like uh, uh, vision or light sensitive organs like our eyes, uh, taste, smell, chemoreceptors, to be able to sense chemicals. Uh, and all of that's towards the head end. And, and that's an, adva an advantage uh, and so uh, you get your brain up there with all those vestibular sensory organs, and this is going to allow for very direct movements uh, within your environment. And typically, uh, these animals will move with with their anterior, which is the front, their front end, where their sensory organs are, like this shark here. This is the front end here. They move around and they can sense their environment. So the shark might be sensing for food sources. Another animal might be sensing for danger. They're moving forward. They detect danger, and then they get out. Uh, they get out of harm's way. Uh, so that's the advantage of bilateral symmetry. And then we have the tissues, or the evolution of tissues there. And all animals are going to start out as zygotes. And this is where uh, a haploid uh, egg is fertilized by a haploid sperm. 
uh, and that's the first cell out of there. So we've already been seeing that. It's the same term used when we're talking about plant uh, reproduction. Uh, and so your your uh, zygote is uh, diploid and it's totipotent and that's just a fancy way of saying it. it's a stem cell that can turn into any of the cells uh, during as the cells continue to divide they have to uh, and so an animal is multicellular so whatever number of different kinds of cells like humans um, the human animal is made up of about 250 different cell types now we're made of trillions of cells but there's identified at least 250 uh, different cell types, cells of muscle, cells of skin, cells sensitive to light in your eyes. Um, so that's what totipotent means. Uh, sometimes I've seen it omnipotent as well. Uh, so uh, this, the uh, embryos are going to develop, uh, and as the cells continue to divide, these cells are uh, differentiating and uh, starting to develop into different tissues. Now, the exception here is sponges. Uh, so uh, these sponges, and you already can see a diver standing next to a very large uh, uh, sponge here. And you can see like this one, you're going to have a real large cavity and inside they call it a barrel sponge. So this individual is standing near a sponge, but sponges are interesting because they don't have tissues. Uh, they are the simplest and most primitive animals. Uh, so tissues are not present and their cells as they have different cell types. Their cells start off as a zygote and their cells go through differentiation and they have several different cell types. And the really cool thing about them is that their cells can de-differentiate. That means they can actually go back and form an original stem type cell and then develop into uh, another cell type. So they can de-differentiate and re-differentiate. And the thing that's interesting here is you can break apart and try to separate almost every cell and they may even come back together and then those cells go through a reorganization to form the cells that are going to make their uh, reorganized body again. Now, that's for sponges. For all of the other animals, this can't happen. Once cells begin to differentiate, they go down certain paths and you cannot reverse it. So for animals, those totipotent zygote cells, when you start dividing, they start turning into different cell types and tish tissues and then, then you, you can't get, you can't reverse back out. Uh, so now another big development was, um, and this one allowed for uh, more advanced structure internally. So now we're talking about organs and organ systems, and that was the evolution of the body cavity. And I already mentioned, uh, sil means cavity, and coelom would mean, it means body cavity. And so we start looking at what kind of internal organization uh, these animals have. So most animals uh, that we're going to be looking at, most animal groups. Okay, so uh, we're talking about the phyla we're going to be studying. Uh, their embryos are going to produce for most, not all. Sponges, not at all, because they don't even have tissues. But for the other embryos, they're going to produce embryonic or early tissues when that first zygote starts to divide, the cells divide and divide, you start to get some very early tissues. There's three basic uh, embryonic tissues or three germ layers, they call them. So germ, a germ layer is embryonic. 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 Uh, which means during that early development during the embryo. So these are embryonic tissues. Okay, that's what the germ layers are. And so these embryonic tissues include an ectoderm, which is on the outside, a meso, which means middle, mesoderm, and an inner endoderm. And those tissues start to form certain things, like the ectoderm, the outside is going to form like your epidermis, your skin, and your nervous system, which includes your brain. Mesoderm is going to form the skeleton and muscle, and the endoderm goes on to form things like your digestive system. Uh, digestive organs. We're going to refer to this three tissue setup as triploblastic. So triploblastic animals. Humans are triploblastic. Your pet dog is triploblastic. Lizards. And many different types of worms. Worm is a general term. Uh, there's many different groups of animals we call worms. Those are triploblastic. And here's something to remember. If you are triploblastic, just like humans, you're going to have bilateral symmetry. That means you can only cut the body one way and get a left and a right. 
and that means you have in these animals, uh, you'll see cephalization. You'll see the, the brain towards the front end. Uh, but not cnidarians. Cnidarians is a phylum called cnidaria, which are the jellyfish belong to that group. Um, the coral, uh, the sea anemone I just drew on the prior slide, those are diploblastic. So they're diploblastic, and that means they're missing a layer. Which layer are they missing? It makes sense. It's the middle one. Because if you only have two layers, you're going to have an inner one and an outer one, and that's it. So they are uh, diploblastic, and they only develop uh, from zygote uh, into uh, two, two basic tissues to start with, endoderm and ectoderm, and that's it. And remember the sponges? They don't have germ layers at all. They don't have germ tissues. So... Um, when it comes to your body plants, body cavity is a, is a big deal, right? And so uh, this is what we're getting at. We were talking about you, you, you got to have those three embryonic uh, layers, the uh, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Now, what happens with those uh, tissues that start to organize and develop organs, how are those organs within the body uh, put together uh, overall? And so there's three basic body plans um, for these bilateral, symmet bilaterally symmetrical animals. Okay? There's those that have a true body cavity. We'll start there, the coelomates. And the reason I'm going to start there with the number one des description here is because uh, when animal body plans were evolving, some of the earliest bilaterally symmetrical animals didn't have a body cavity and one branch went off and never got a body cavity. Uh, they're called the A seal. A means without A without a cavity. They're called the A seal worms. They never got a body, body cavity. And there's a line of those animals. They're still alive today. The other group went off and developed a body cavity. Uh, and that was the first thing to evolve. Uh, this is only more recent understanding. So when I first learned about animal diversity, this was not known or well understood. So this is what the evidence points to. Again, these are hypotheses about relationships based on evidence. But the sea was the first one to evolve, right? And then uh, some, uh, and that's a true body cavity. So the but name of the body cavity is called the sea and the animals that have that are called sea mates. Like, hey, mate, you know, you're you're my you're an animal. Uh, so that's uh, where it comes from. But some of them lost some of the attributes that define a coelom, and they have a false body cavity. And this won't make sense unless we, until we define what a true body cavity is. But we call those pseudocelomates, and their body cavity would be called a pseudocelom. And then you have the acelomates, which have no body cavity. And so now when we talk about cavity, the digestive system, when you ingest food, there's a cavity there too. That's the gut cavity, okay? Um, or the digestive cavity. So you can see that highlighted here. There's your digestive cavity, digestive cavity, digestive cavity. That's inside that yellow tube that you see in there, okay? That's not the body cavity. That's the cavity of the digestive system. But if we look at those three layers and how they're put together, let's start with the coelom because that was early on when the, the first thing to evolve. The coelom is going to be completely enclosed by endoderm. Okay, I mean, I'm sorry, mesoderm. And so mesoderm here is in red. Okay, so this is, it'll say right here, mesodermally derived tissue. Okay, so you see here that cavity, that space, it's like they slice through this earthworm here, and we're looking at a uh, very simplified because there's a lot more organs in there. But essentially, uh, you can see that that coelom is surrounded by mesoderm completely. It's completely enclosed on both sides, both on the inside and the outside of the cavity of the body wall of the animal is completely enclosed by mesoderm. That's a coelom. Here we have a roundworm. It's not the same as an earthworm. Earthworms are a different group. Here we cut a cross section through there, and there, again, you have the digestive cavity, but look at the body cavity there. You have a, a pink on one side, which is mesoderm, and on the other side of that cavity, the cavity is all in here, where it looks uh, empty in there. Uh, that cavity is actually will be filled with fluid, and, and there's other organs in there, but so a simplified drawing here, you can see that the body cavity is not completely enclosed by mesoderm, and that makes it a false body cavity. And then this flatworm over here, 
the flatworm doesn't even have a body cavity. All of the tissues are packed together, right? So the, the blue is the uh, ectoderm, uh, ectodermally derived, which become the epidermis, uh, the mesoderm, and then uh, the yellow is the endoderm, which remember in the earlier slides that's going to be responsible for making the digestive system, right? So, uh, so what we see evolutionarily trend is the uh, coelom evolved, and then in several groups, uh, some of the groups lost to become pseudo coelom or uh, lost part of it, and then lost it all completely together. Now, what's significant about these body cavities is that uh, these body cavities allow when you have them, allow for more complex uh, organs uh, to develop or evolve within there. They allow space for them to move around, uh, specialization within your digestive system. It's not just one long hollow tube anymore. You got a stomach, you got a small intestine, and so on. Uh, and then if you're going to have a lot of mass of, of body uh, there, then you're going to have cells within those tissues, within those organs, within that cavity, within that body that need to get nutrients and oxygen and need to get rid of waste. And you can't just do that with the environment directly. So you're going to need a circulatory system. Okay? Uh, so uh, we see some circulatory systems uh, evolve. Uh, and the, again, this is going to help us uh, uh, circulate a fluid around there that's going to help deliver oxygen and nutrients and help get rid of waste and take that waste to organs that allow us to excrete or get rid of it. So uh, when we look at uh, coelomates, those are the true body count. These guys, right, like the earthworm and us humans, so we're coelomates as well. There's two basic kinds of uh, circulatory systems. There's an open circulatory system. And there's a closed circulatory system. For an open circulatory system, the fluid that's um, circulated around, sometimes it goes by different names. For now, this, it's okay, we, we call it blood, but uh, sometimes they call it hemolymph, like in this diagram here. Okay. Now, essentially here, there's going to be an organ or organs that do circulate actively with the help of muscle to pump that fluid around. But that fluid goes through a small network of vessels, like our, our veins and our arteries, goes through those vessels, but then those vessels open up and then allow that fluid to circulate around uh, the, the cavity, the body cavity or sinuses within that cavity. And so that circulates around and then ends up, as it goes through, the, let's say that this yellow box is the cavity, eventually that fluid goes back uh, to the heart and then circulate around again. The best analogy I can uh, give for this are those power pumps they use in aquariums. They take water in and then they force water out the other way and usually it'll pass through a filter uh, and then the water circulates around that uh, aquarium. Uh, so it's similar to that. For a closed circulatory system that's more like us, uh, and here again you have a heart, you're going to have blood vessels, and here this earthworm, which has uh, both this grasshopper and this earthworm, two different kinds of groups of animals. The earthworm has a closed circulatory system in that its blood does not leave the vessels. So the blood gets circulated around to smaller vessels, uh, to those tissues in the organs to go deliver oxygen, uh, nutrients, and then bring and then get waste out and then can take that waste to excretory organs. So circulatory system is an important part of the evolution of uh, bodies and animals. Uh, and then um, when it comes to bilateral symmetry, and we're going to call animals that have bilateral symmetry bilaterians. Yes, that, so when we say bilateral, that's your symmetry. When we say bilaterians, that's an animal with bilateral symmetry, right? So we can actually uh, group these uh, animals uh, and the pattern of the development actually re like reflects phylogeny as well, their relationships uh, uh, to each other. Uh, in other words, going back and finding a common ancestor. So uh, to do that, we got to understand how the embryo develops so that we can see how it develops. So we call this area of study developmental biology. It's also called embryology. And you do some comparative study where you study different animals and you start to see these similarities and patterns that uh, actually reflect uh, evolutionary lines uh, evolving from a specific ancestry. So when we look at the bilaterian pattern, we're going we're to look at things like the way uh, the cells divide. There's a certain pattern that we see in there. 
there's a pattern in that cell division, and so we'll, we'll get to that. So first of all, let's see well, how do you develop uh, either way. So we're going to see two groups. Both groups are going to have the same pattern overall, uh, but there's going to be little differences once we understand the basic development here. So uh, first of all, you start off as a zygote, and then as the cells divide by mitosis, we call that cleavage. So the cell divides once, you, you got uh, your cells, the, the nucleus is identical, you start to switch on different sets of genes as these cells both start going through different lines of development to form different tissues. So here you have an eight cell stage, so that's like three divisions. First division gives you two, two gives you four, second division, each of those four divide again, that gives you eight. So this is after three divisions, and then you continue to go through a division and eventually the cell turns into this hollow ball of cells. This stage of the embryo in all bilaterians is called a blastula. Okay. So at the blastula stage, if we were to slice through it, it's hollow inside. It's filled with fluid, but it's hollow inside. And a lot of these cells have already gone down and have been uh, switched on certain sets of genes. They're going to start becoming certain things. And some of that programming is telling some of these cells that they're going to start migrating. As they divide, those new cells are going to start migrating inwards. And as they start migrating inwards, that process is called gastrulation. That's a process. The cells start to move inward, and at this stage right here, that's when the germ layers are forming. So the germ layers, the endoderm, ectoderm, start to form. But you might notice, and we've sliced into the ball right here, in this cell here. It's actually a sphere, and so this little uh, notch that you see forming right in there, and that little opening, it's actually, a, it's actually a sphere, and then there's a hole developing with a little pouch in there. That little opening, it's an opening in that blastula that's gonna be called the blastopore. That's important, so there you see blastopore. That's gonna be an opening to the outside. And what's forming in there, you already, already have your two basic tissues, the first two. We still need the third one. Now, with only two at this point, we're going to have endoderm and ectoderm starting to form here. You can see them labeled there. And what we have here, that the endoderm, which is in yellow, remember, it's going to help form the digestive system. So what do we have right in there? That's your primitive gut. So that primitive gut is called the arc and archae or archaic means ancient, right? So archenteron. And entero means intestine in translation or uh, your digestive tract. So archenteron. So that cavity in there is called the archenteron, which is a primitive. Uh, and I, I got these notes initially and I noted this. It's it's not a primitive uh, gut cavity. It's a primitive, uh, it's a primitive, um, it's a primitive not, uh, not gut cavity, that should be crossed out. It's a primitive body cavity. So be aware of that if you download this outline, that it's a primitive body cavity there. And so uh, now that we know that those basics there, to know, to know these things, with your blastopore and your archenteron, now we can see what are the differences between those two different groups of bilaterians. So uh, one group, or uh, one clade that share ancestry, very early on in this uh, bilaterian evolution, are going to be called protostomes. And proto means first. It can mean before, but it can also mean first. And stome, we've seen that before, stomata under the leaves, stoma. And I've mentioned this before, the root of that means mouth. Okay. In protostomes, the blastopore, which is the first opening, becomes the mouth. So you see, when we come back over here, that's the first opening in the embryo, okay? What ends up happening is that a second it opening, sometimes it's on the other end of the, of the ball there of cells. This uh, uh, ectoderm goes all the way to the other end and ends up forming another opening on the other side. That would be the second opening, okay? So in protostomes, that first opening, the blastopore, becomes the mouth and the other opening would become the anus for a complete digestive tract. So we can see that here in this image that I borrowed, it's not in the book. Here's your blastula, gastrulation has occurred. We even had mesoderm forming. We haven't seen uh, how that forms exactly yet. Turns out there's a difference between protostomes and deuterostomes. Uh, here's your archenteron here. 
that's your blastopore. That blastopore becomes the mouth. Okay? You can see eventually, from this stage to the next over here, another opening forms, and that's the anus. So for protostomes, first opening, which is the blastopore, becomes the mouth. For deuterostomes, there's stoma again. Deutero means second. Second opening becomes the mouth. Okay. And uh, so for deuterostomes, um, the uh, second opening becomes the mouth, and the first opening becomes the anus. So you can see there, we have our blastula, blastopore here, our kenturon. Uh That first opening here is the anus, the second opening becomes the mouth. So deutero means second. Now, uh, humans and um, other mammals and uh, animals with backbones, birds and all that, uh, and some other more primitive looking uh, relatives are deuterostomes and starfish are deuterostomes. There's only two major groups of animals that are deuterostomes. Everything else that's a bilaterian, that doesn't include the jellyfish, doesn't include the sponges, but all the bilaterally symmetrical ones are either protostomes or deuterostomes. All the other groups, all the other five are going to be protostomes. The group we belong to and starfish, which is another group, only two find our deuterostomes. So that would make it easier to remember if you can remember which ones are deuterostomes and the other bilaterians are protostomes. Right? So now we look at patterns of development and I'm not going to uh, try to labor a lot over what you see here. This is a slide that describes what we're going to see in a diagram. I think it's best to go there. Uh, so here we look at uh, the cleavage pattern uh, that occurs. Remember cleavage is the way the cells divide. And uh, the protostomes have spiral cleavage. I'll go and I'll explain what that means on the on the, the next slide. Deuterostomes, remember the second one becomes the mouth. They have what's called radial cleavage. So we'll go and we'll define what that looks like right now. But just there's a distinction. The way cleavage occurs is different between the two. Okay. Now the fate of the cells when they're developing for protostomes is a determinate development and deuterostomes is indeterminate. Okay. And that just means. Uh, in one case, you can get identical twins, and the other you can't. And I'll tell you why when we look at the diagram. Okay. Uh, and then how the coelom is formed. Okay. And in order to get a coelom, uh, we have to have a mesoderm. So here, we saw in some of the other diagrams, we only saw the blue and the red colored cells. The blue was the ectoderm, the outside, and the yellow was the endoderm. On the inside, we didn't see red. Uh, there's another diagram that I showed a little bit earlier that showed it the red forming, but I didn't explain it. But when those red cells start showing up in our diagrams, they're not red in, in real life, but the mesoderm. When the mesoderm starts forming, that's going to be responsible for the coelom, and how that coelom forms differs between protostomes and deuterostomes. So let's take a look at how that differs. This diagram summarizes what the other cells were saying. So uh, up here we're in the first row, this row right here, those are the protostomes. These are the, down here, this row down here is deuterostomes. Now this diagram, the way they show the formation of the mouth and the anus is a little different. Uh, they're going to show the blastopore form on the bottom here and on the top on this one here. Uh, so they only have to draw one uh, embryo stage here where they have the mouth and anus instead of the other diagram here. So. You want to make sure you understand that difference in those two diagrams, the one that I borrowed from another book and the one they represent here. But let's take a look at cleavage. Cleavage is how they divide. Protostomes is up here on the top. And this shows an early four-cell uh, four uh, embryo. And then the next division, all of these cells are going to divide. So every one of these cells is going to divide. You're going to get um, some new cells here. And you're going to get some on the other side. So we're just looking on this side here. And when those cells divide, as they're dividing off, the, the cells that come off of there seem to twist uh, in their position relative to the cells they came from. And so they kind of show this from the top. You can see that ends up with this cells, these blue cells, which are the new ones, are kind of placed in between two other cells because they twisted uh, from, their, from the position of the older cells. So this cell here seems to be in between these two other cells here. And so they show from the side view when those cells divide, the cells that come off have sort of twisted. So that's called spiral cleavage. Okay. This is different for deuterostomes, which is a group 
uh, we and the starfish belong to. When the cells at four embryo stage divide, the cells come straight out from there. They radiate outward. Instead of twisting and spiraling, they just kind of radiate outward. So you can see that the new cells are resting right on top of the other ones. Okay. Uh, and so the cells just kind of st come straight out there. So that would be a radial cleavage. Uh, as far as the fate of the embryo cells, for protostomes, when the cells start dividing very early on, very early in cleavage, the zygote, and then you get two cells and then four cells, those cells have already gone down their path of development and they can't back out. Remember, we talked about that. So that means that each one of these cells that we see just in the four embryo stage, they've already gotten their, their genes programmed within there that those cells are already going to go down a path to, to build certain parts of the animal and you can't back out. So if you experimentally cut out one of those cells, this cell doesn't divide, these cells don't divide it, they might develop a little bit further, but eventually development stops and the embryo dies. That's it. For deuterostromes like ourselves, the cells don't differentiate very early. They have to go through several divisions further down before they start going down those paths. So that's indeterminate. So this is very early, very early on. And so what happens here, like even at the four cell stage, if I take off one of those cells, it hasn't started going down that path. So that one cell can actually grow into a whole new, a whole animal. The other three cells will grow into another animal. And guess what? Both of those would be genetic, uh, uh, genetically identical. There would be identical twins. This is why we can get twins in humans you get twins in, in other deuterostomes. If it were a protostome, keep that in mind, because I have a question on that. Any protostome, you would never find an identical twin, because in order to get an identical twin, it has to be the same egg and the same sperm, and you get that zygote. And then as that zygote starts to divide, if a cell accidentally breaks off during that time early, early in development, it can happen later on. Like once you get to these stages out here, it's not gonna happen. They've already gone down their paths, right? But earlier, at the four cell stage, maybe even the eight cell stage, indeterminate, they haven't gone down their paths and you can get identical uh, from there. Uh, and then segmentation. So segmentation is, uh, you can define it as where you have uh, what looks like a repetition of uh, portions of the body. It looks like the, these segments of the body are repeating. Like when you look at an earthworm, the earthworm, it's going to be built and it's going to look like these segments here. Now, there are going to be some differences, but in many of the segments, you're going to see some of the same thing. Within there, you're going to see an intestine, you're going to see a repeat of pairs of excretory organs and so on. So that's one of the things there is that the segmentation allows for redundant organ systems. And redundancy means you can just repeat those organs. But another big deal for segmentation is that segmentation allows for the body to move independent. Uh, for the body parts to move independent, more independently. Uh, so what this allows is for more flexibility, more complex movements, right? Now, um, segmentation used to be one of those morphological characters that they were using to kind of help uh, try to establish evolutionary relationships, phylogenies. Uh, but it turns out that uh, it's not a real good indicator because the newer evidence, the new data, suggest otherwise. The new data suggests that segmentation actually evolved several times in different groups of animals uh, as animal phyla were evolving. This section is going to be on animal phylogeny and so we're going we're to look at hypotheses about how uh, these different animal groups are related. And so uh, your learning objectives are to identify the characters that distinguish the major animal phyla and then identify patterns of convergent evolution. This is where different groups on different branches of the evolutionary tree uh, come to evolve similar uh, types of structures. Uh, and so looking at convergent evolution uh, as, a, uh, as characters that you use to try to establish phylogeny. So convergent evolution, remember, uh, that can lead to um, uh, uh, problems with trying to, to establish a, a, a phylogeny because uh, it creates what's called homoplasies going back to our chapter 23. Uh, and then uh, um, 
we're going to identify the placement of humans among uh, the animal phyla. So anatomy and embryology, is just, anatomy is just the structure, the morphology, embryology is that development, was used uh, to infer um, uh, animal phylogeny. And uh, I still remember learning some of these older phylogenies. Um, things seem to be much simpler back then, but it, uh, think about how long evolution has been taking place. Things make sense that things are a lot more complicated than our first views, given the limitations of the evidence we had. But now in the past 30 years, looking at sequencing data, sequencing of DNA and RNAs and proteins, has allowed us to study these relationships more closely. And uh, it's resolved some issues, uh, problems that have um, that had and that have created other ones. So um, in this past 30 years, uh, we now look. We now look at animal phylogeny differently. In other words, the things I learned 20 years ago don't actually hold up today. Uh, so again, this is resolved problems, but uh, it's created some other ones. So, uh, current understanding of, uh, of phylogeny, the evolutionary history of animals, does differ from traditional uh, views. Um, there are some commonality though uh, overall. Uh, so the traditional animal, animal phylogeny was developed by looking at uh, structure, morphology, life history, uh, the life cycle of, and the development of uh, different animals um, and other types of data. The new phylogenies are constructed uh, not ignoring the morphological life history. That's important. But molecular data has revealed that there are some uh, uh, surprising differences compared to what uh, biologists once thought. Um, now, some some parts of the phylogeny are not firmly established, so these are hypotheses. They're subject to change. Uh, and there's new studies that are constantly providing data that uh, causes more questions. So uh, this is an active area of study trying to figure out uh, the evolutionary history of the animal kingdom. And so when we look at uh, the classification of animals, and we hope that this classification, at least when it comes to these bigger groups, that it does reflect their phylogeny, their evolutionary history. So animals can be divided into two distinct groups uh, overall. Uh, and uh, there's going to be the group where we don't have true tissues, and that's the sponges. And then there's the group uh, that do have true tissues, and that's called the eumetazoa, which might be true animals. Uh, and overall, all of the animals as an entire group would be called metazoa. Uh, and so that's to distinguish from animal-like simple organisms that are protists uh, here. So you can see on this uh, tree, this, uh, this cladogram here, this uh, phylogenetic tree that we see here, you have an ancestral protist probably closely related to coanoflagellates that we studied in the protist chapter. And the first main branch very, very far back <laughs> is one that where you have no tissues and we still have these sponges today. Those are uh, uh, a group that we're going to refer to as uh, the parazoa, which uh, is not quite true uh, animals. They're just um, they're on the side there um, as a, an out group. Uh, and again, all together, uh, all referred to as metazoa. And then we have the true tissues here. And then earlier on the earlier slide, we had one group that only develops from two germ layers, ectoderm and endoderm, and all of those are going to be radial symmetry. And examples are those like the jellyfish, uh, corals, sea anemones. The other one are triploblastic. The triploblastic, so we might write uh, triploblast. Triploblasty over here. Diploblasty. Only two germ layers. So out here we have our bilateral symmetry, and then there's going to be two divisions there. The protostomes, which we mentioned earlier, and they all share common ancestry. And then the deuterostomes, which like I said earlier, includes the starfish uh, and the chordates, which includes animals with backbones like the snake and a human. Uh, and so uh, we're seeing these groups here in the protostomes, and then the protostomes are divided into some other groups. So we'll start looking at that uh, part of the, of, the, of the tree a little bit later here. The eumetazoans themselves, I mentioned earlier, they can be divided into the bilateria, uh, 
not the bilateria, the uh, radial area, the, the radial symmetry ones, and then the bilateria over here. So these are the bilateria, the bilaterally symmetrical on this branch out here. Uh, and then the bilateria can be uh, divided into the deuterostomes and then the protostomes, uh, which we saw here. This is the branch for the deuterostomes and the branch for the protostomes there. Uh, so know that basic uh, setup there. That's something that you should know. And then they just have uh, some animal phyla here. This is a small subset. Remember, there's up to 40 different animal phyla. And here we have two, four, six, eight, about eight or nine phyla there only. This table kind of summarizes some uh, common animal phyla and some that have only recently been discovered. It gives the number of species here to the right. I'm not going to go read through all of these, but these are some of the animal phyla we're going to be covering here. The flatworms, platyhomenthes, the chordates, that's the group we belong to. And this table gives these key characteristics. So this would be a real good uh, uh, thing you can go back to and review or maybe build a similar table like this for yourself. Make your own table that summarizes important information, like whether or not you're a, a coelomate uh, or you're an acelomate. Uh, other characters like you're bilaterally symmetrical, and then again, the number of species there. So, uh, I'm not going to read through the entire table there, uh, but you're fine to continue here. And I think maybe there's not more than 18 on this table. This again, there's 40. Textbook covers more than your lab manual covers. Uh, in, the, in the lecture, you're going to be expected to know a bit about some of these different phyla. In the lab, you're going to be expected to know about less phyla, but more detail in, in those phyla uh, structure, life cycles, that kind of stuff. And so we continue on here. Uh, this little microscope was called rotifers, and those uh, water bears that was on that uh, first little sub video that was put in uh, on the first slide. But here's some interesting ones here. This is something new for me, the Placozoa. I never heard of them before. Uh, and the uh, Micronathozoa, these must be micro animals here. Uh, they were discovered in uh, Greenland in 2000, and there's only uh, one species, at least according to the textbook. Uh, for this entirely new group of animals or new phylum here. So that's interesting there. The comb jellies are pretty cool. I like those. We'll see those in a bit. So go through that table. I mean, there's an interest of time. I'm not going to read through it all, but it, it's, it's like uh, a summary of things we're going to be covering in the future chapters. It's not all the important information, but the big uh, 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 characters when it comes to these groups. So some important developments that uh, new uh, new revelations, new things that were revealed by um, uh, molecular studies. Uh, one is that I remember when I learned this, the the annelids, which are the earthworms and the arthropods, which are things like uh, crayfish, lobsters. Uh, they used to be uh, grouped. Uh, uh, more closely together as if they shared more recent common ancestry. And it's, it's seen that that seems that that's not the case. Uh, and one of the things that uh, they were using was that segmentation that you see. If you look at uh, something like a centipede or a millipede that belongs to the arthropoda, they have body segments, and that looks very, very similar to the earthworms that have those segments. Uh, but new studies have revealed that the arthropods actually should be grouped uh, with another group of animals that they now call, refer to as a clade, uh, called the ectosisoans. And ectosis means to shed, as in shedding your outer layer, uh, uh, your cuticle. And that's what molt means. Molt means to shed, so they shed their outer layer. Now, this is not the same as a snake shedding its skin. Okay, so this is different. Uh, and so that's a different group here. So if we were to zoom into this phylogeny, which shows uh, those animal groups that were mentioned um, earlier here. You can see here, here's this one clade within the protostomes. Okay? And here are your arthropods. There's like a lobster or crayfish there. So the earthworms used to be uh, more close, closely related, it would have been grouped closer over here, would have been in this clay, sharing uh, this branch of the evolutionary tree here, sharing some common ancestry. But it turns out that the annelids are on another branch off to the left over here, and that branch uh, for the annelids is a group called the spiralia. 
Uh, and this is what molecular data has shown. And so uh, all of these that are over here do share a characteristic bolt. They shed their outer uh, cuticle. Uh, and in this case, that would be an exoskeleton for the arthropods. So the one I learned back uh, when I was learning it, the annelids were more closely related. So this is something that uh, the molecular data has shown. Okay. Uh, also, uh, it is there is still difficulty in trying to group some of these identified uh, animal groups, these phyla. And so uh, some where to place them is not well known or, or understood exactly. So an example is the comb jellies. They look like uh, like jellyfish. They're radially symmetrical. I'll show you the comb jellies in a bit. They belong to a group called the Tenophora. That T is silent. And they look very much like jellyfish over here to the left of Nidaria. And so they kind of put them here somewhere between the radially symmetrical diploblast group. And when we get out here, we come out here and we go over here, diploblast. These tenophers, the comb jellies, it's not really understood whether or not uh, what kind of uh, development they have early on. Uh, so uh, whether or not they would be more bilateral or, or radial. So they're kind of just out here, somewhere between uh, this, this group here and then the bilaterians. The bilaterians come off out this way here. Uh, so here they're kind of put out here tentatively as a uh, an offshoot or an outgroup uh, when we compare to the rest of the bilaterian out this way. So the bilaterian, remember, include the protostomes and the deuterostomes, right? Another group that they're not sure, and you can see it just comes off right off here. This doesn't look like it shares any ancestry with any others other than seeing them out here. Uh, and these are the arrowworms or the ketognathans here. This is another one where they're not sure if it has a protostome development or a deuterostome development. Overall, so for now, placeholder somewhere between here and there with these groups. Uh, overall, so uh, more studies are needed uh, to try to resolve those issues. Uh, so um, looking at um, the earlier phylogenies, um, uh, they were based on the evolution of the celome. So it was thought that if you had a true body cavity, you should be together. And if you had a pseudo celome, you were together and you shared that ancestry. Remember I told you early on, I tried to get ahead of this and said, it seems that the celome appeared first and then other groups lost it. And that's what this is, this is talking about. It's using the celome to try to establish that a phylogeny is not reliable. Okay, using that body cavity because the new information suggests, supports the idea that the celome appeared once. And that means all of these animal groups in the bilateria can be traced back to an ancestor that had a celome. It's just that as the animal groups started branching out and going through their evolution, some of them ended up evolving a pseudo celome, some had an A celome. Um, and that's for the protostomes. For the deuterostomes, which are the starfish and the group we belong to, they all have celomes. Okay, so that's something, that, again, commit that to memory. So then you say, well, it's the other group of protostomes that are, are variable. Those are the ones I got to spend a little bit more time because I got it for deuterostomes. Okay, they have a celome. And so we, if we focus in and just zoom in just to point out a few of them out here. Here's your bilateria. We come out, we start branching out here. Earlier I said you had an early uh, divergence, a separation, early on. Remember, we're, we're further back down this tree here. We're further back in time. And we had one group that never evolved a body cavity. That's the acelo or the acelomorpha group. Uh, these are, uh, they call, they're called a kind of worms, but they never, their evolutionary history never includes the celome. And then the other group over here, the branch that includes all of these, the protostomes and deuterostomes, initially started off with a celome, and then all the deuterostomes here have a celome. Okay, it's kind of during the starfish and the chordates, which is our group. When we come out here, the ancestor had celome, but some of them end up like this one right here, a pseudo celome out here. This uh, little micro animal, another pseudo uh, And then you even have the flatworms out here, no body cavity. Uh, so uh, 
what they once thought based on body cavity doesn't hold. The the new uh, the new yeah. data, the new information shows that it's not the sea loam that helps define the evolutionary history because the sea loam evolved once, and then some animal groups lost it, uh, lost a true body cavity. Uh, the protostomes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they can be divided into the spiralians and the ones that shed. Uh, and the spiralians uh, are actually divided into two subgroups, the lophotrochozoans, um, then you have your ectosozoans. And here's a picture of the blue crab that we have here in our waters. It's a pretty widespread uh, crab in the marine areas here. You can see it's shedding its former exoskeleton, uh, and then the new exoskeleton will harden up on there. So the ectosis means to molt or to shed. And this is uh, true of arthropods, which are uh, crabs, lobsters, insects, and so on. Um, and um, let's see here. So we come out here, you have the ectosozoans here, and then you have the spiralia, uh, which include the lophotrochozoan and another subgroup called the platyzoa uh, there. So um, for the deuterostomes, this includes the chordates and the echinoderms, like starfish, spiny skin animals. Um, there's uh, very few phyla in this group, and the two main uh, phyla are um, the echinoderms and the chordates. Um, so the starfish doesn't look very much like us or a bird or some of the other um, uh, chordates that you see there, but uh, there are some other things that really tie together, including the way they develop early on, and, and again, uh, combine that with molecular data and molecular information. Uh, so, the uh, kingdom animalia I mentioned earlier, all the animals may be referred to as metazoa to distinguish them from protists that are animal-like. Uh, and then two main branches, you have the sponges, the parazoa, they lack tissues. Uh, so that's one uh, phylum in there. And then you have the eumetazoa, uh, which uh, are the animals that are defined by having symmetry, having tissues, uh, even organs and organ systems. So in this section, we're going to look at the parazoa. And this is the sponges, the phylum periphera, which means to carry or bear pores. For, uh, for us, uh, derived from the, the word phores, to carry. Uh, and these guys lack specialized tissues. So your learning outcomes are to describe the different types of cells that you see in a sponge body uh, and explain the function of cells called coanocytes. And uh, this right here is the left side of that uh, uh, animal phylogeny that we were seeing earlier in the prior section. And I want to point out that... Um, I mistakenly left older slides from the prior edition, uh, so there are some differences right here. Uh, for example, the tenophora, the comb jellies, are on this side, and the, the nidaria is on this side, and then they added the placazoa, which is something new that wasn't even included in the prior edition. And so I accidentally left that one in there, and that uh, presented a little bit of uh, uh, confusion in what I was uh, saying earlier, because I was looking at that other cladogram. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, use the one in your in your textbook to to uh, to show this, but it still shouldn't change the idea that these guys are out here. Uh, out here, you have a radial symmetry, and then to the right of there, you're going to have bilateral symmetry. So uh, that's a little error to, to try to clean up here. Um, after uh, the fact from that other uh, section. So here we're talking about sponges. Uh, most of them are marine. 26,000 species are marine. That means they live in the saltwater oceans and bays and so on. And then 150 fresh water. Uh, these are one of the most abundant animals in the deep oceans out there. And so some sponge characteristics. They lack symmetry. So when it comes to symmetry, you're going to see uh, asymmetrical. You're going to have uh, some sort of definite symmetry when you have tissues here with no tissues, no symmetry. Um, there's various growth forms there. You have barrel type sponges, vase type, uh, they call them just in structure overall. Now the larva uh, sponges are going to be free swimming. So the larva, uh, when they're produced after a fertilized egg, they'll swim to an area, they'll land, uh, and then uh, transition into their adult form. 
in those state put. So that, that term is sessile, which I introduced in an earlier um, section. There's different cell types, so they are truly multicellular. When it comes to the body of the sponge, there's going to be three functional layers, uh, and you'll find uh, some specific kind of cell types within those layers. So uh, here you, you see this uh, uh, this sponge here and, and uh, the adult form that's sessile. Uh, so looking at the body plan of a, of a relatively simple sponge here with a simple wall, you have the outer layer and the outer layer is going to be made of, of epithelial cells or epithelial wall. This is the outside, so it's like they took a section from the right side in this diagram here. And then we're zooming in uh, to see overall here. Uh, looking at the body itself, the, the, the sponge is going to have a wall. It'll have pores, special cells that make pores, and that allows water to go in there. Uh, they're going to have a cavity on the inside, and that cavity or is going to be called the sponges cell. Remember, cell means cavity, so cavity of the sponge in translation. So basically, water goes in uh, into the sponge cell from the outside through the pores and then comes out. And what creates that current is what's on the inside, the internal lining of the sponge cell. Uh, when we zoom in out here, it's going to have these special cells, which look very familiar to the coanoflagellates we saw at the end of the chapter on protists, except these are called coanocytes. They have a very similar structure. Uh, Coanos means collar. They have that little collar there. They have the flagella. The flagella beats, creates the water current. As the water passes through here, food particles will either be absorbed by the wall or picked up by the coanocytes and then passed into special cells like amoebocytes here. The cells that make up the, um, or that make the pores, sometimes called porocytes. Uh, sometimes they're called uh, ostea or osteocytes, uh, or osteo, uh, osteocytes, that's a bone cell. Uh, and then some cells produce these special structures within the wall called, spic uh, special structures called spicules, which will provide support. Some of them are made of, of uh, calcium, some are made of glass, uh, and then other kinds of uh, spicules that are made of a uh, flexible protein called spongin. It's very similar to the collagen we find in uh, our skin there. So these different cell types here, uh, and here you see an amoebocyte interacting with a coanocyte, which is in the cell wall there. The coanocyte may pick up food particles, uh, take them in uh, by phagocytosis, and then can pass on those substances to the amoebocytes there. So on number three, lining the inside is going to be those coanocytes. They're also called uh, collar cells. They have flagella, which helps create uh, the current there. And they do pick up food and pass, uh, help create the water current in there. The internal wall there is called the mesohill. It's sort of a gelatinous ma uh, matrix. And in there, you'll find those uh, spicules uh, that are made of either calcium or, um, or glass uh, silicate. Some may be made of silicate. So they call them glass sponges. So that's silicate. Uh, and then uh, some are just don't even have calcium or or, uh, or silicate spicules. They just have sponge in, and they call it a natural sponge because uh, when the animal dies, they live behind this uh, sponge and skeleton that's real squishy, and people used to use those for bath sponges and so on. And then you have your outer epithelium, uh, and uh, you have those porocytes that create those uh, openings called the ostea. So looking at, uh, that's the basic, and that's a very simple sponge. There's a lot, there's very complex sponges where you can't tell where the sponge cell is. There's so many cavities within there and so many openings. Uh, it's just like uh, this entire uh, matrix of uh, little miniature cavities within there. But sponges do reproduce, and one way they reproduce is through uh, asexual reproduction, and they can uh, reproduce by fragmentation. Uh, another way they uh, they may reproduce is to produce packets of those amoebocytes, which is not on the slide and not necessarily mentioned, uh, I believe, in your book. But they'll produce these little packets of amoeba, those amoebocytes that are found within the wall, and those will be released out of the, the ostium up here at the top, and those are called gemmules. And we saw a similar term, uh, gemmy cups, when it came to... Um, uh, they, the way that uh, uh, liverworts uh, 
base actually will produce. They produce these little chip-like uh, little bundles of uh, plant cells that can get spread by water and then go germinate and form a whole other plant asexually. Then they have a the sexual reproduction. And here, the coanocytes, we saw that flagella makes sense. They're going to basically differentiate into sperm uh, cells. Now, those uh, sperm cells will end up being released out of the ostium and then make their way to a sponge nearby and get taken in. And they get taken in through the pores. And then the sperm actually will enter the wall there. And in there, amoebocytes will develop into egg cells. And so the eggs will get fertilized within the wall. So this prevents self-fertilization. So they cross-fertilize with another individual here. And so then you get a zygote. And then the zygote goes through those divisions, through mitosis, uh, and eventually will produce uh, a larva that will escape out of the wall and then uh, there's that larva uh, escaping and going land somewhere and then grow into an adult sponge. Uh, the larva will become part of the plankton for a while, so it'll be floating around, maybe able to swim a little bit, but mostly be under the influence of water currents and then settle and transfer into an adult. This diagram was not from your book. I had to get it to help illustrate how sponges do sexual reproduction. In this section, we begin the eumetazoa. And so these are going to be animals with true tissues. And your learning outcomes are to explain the defining features of cnidarians, which include jellyfish, differentiate between cnidarians and tenophores. And those are the comb jellies, uh, cnidarians, the jellyfish, corals, sea anemones. And then discuss uh, the question of symmetry of tenophores. Uh, and so uh, animals here, we're looking at animals with true tissues, as in the title. Uh, the embryos are going to have distinct layers. Uh, here, when we talk about the layers, the germ layers, that was the uh, endoderm, the inside, the ectoderm on the out, and then mesoderm on the inside. And the endoderm is going to form the lining of the gut, which is called the gastroderm, uh, dermis, or gastroderm. And then ectoderm will form the epidermis and the nervous system, and then the mesoderm uh, which we only find in bilaterians. Okay. So when we start looking at uh, jellyfish, uh, which are the cnidarians, they only have the two germ layers. They don't have the mesoderm. And so uh, we're going to start to see, though, true body symmetry. We're going to have radial and bilateral, as mentioned in an earlier section. And for now, the cnidarians, which is going to be the main part of this section here, with small discussion of the tenophores, um, they're going to be radially symmetrical. And then at the very end of the last section, we'll have the bilaterians. Uh, we'll start the bilaterians with the acetylomorph uh, flatworms. And so we start with the tenifers, and there's a video of some of these comb jellies. They're bioluminescent, live in deep water, so it's really cool. Uh, you can see the bioluminescence there. Uh, and that's uh, a gooseberry. Uh, they're commonly called comb jellies, uh, sea walnuts, or gooseberries. And you see it here on the, the cladogram here. It is part of the eumetazoa. Uh, and we're looking at uh, the Tenophora. And I said earlier that uh, the uh, prior textbook had no switch and then didn't even have the placophores there, uh, or the placozoans. Sorry. Uh, so the, the comb jellies, they're going to have, they look kind of like jellyfish. They, uh, they have these uh, eight rows of comb like plates that have cilia. Uh, that beat in a coordinated fashion, many can bioluminesce. They're going to have two tentacles. You see the two tentacles in the video there. And they're going to be have a special cell called coloblasts. And uh, when we look at jellyfish, they're going to have special stinging cells that have a different name. But these coloblasts do discharge a, a sticky adhesive that helps them capture prey. And again, their phylogenetic position is not clear. Uh, and... Uh, Part of the reason is uh, they, not, they may not be sure of these uh, during their development, what happens with uh, some of the embryonic tissues, so that creates some confusion uh, as to where exactly they go. Uh, so um, that's the ten of first, not much on there, and you can see um, their position here. Um, probably tentative. It's a hypothesis. Then we're going to move on to the Nidarians. And I found some videos of a box jelly there swimming and so on, so you can look at that uh, uh, there. But uh, it's pronounced Nidaria. 
Uh, and all they do is are carnivores, something to remember there. Uh, most are marine. There's some freshwater species, and we can see their position here on the on the phylogeny. We're still we're out to the left here. You have the parasols, no tissues here. Two germ layers. Uh, that's a lamprey, not a jellyfish. Uh, it's a video that goes over how these animals move, the physics of it. So, but there's jellyfish in the footage there. But the cnidarians uh, uh, right here, radial symmetry, two germ layers only, ectoderm and endoderm when they develop. Uh, and then going off to the right here is where you have your bilateria right here. Uh, and so we're not there yet. So they are, uh, the cnidarians, the jellyfish included, are diploblastic. That's related to their radial symmetry. The bodies have distinct tissues though. Um, they don't have real complex major systems like reproductive system. They do have organs uh, overall, uh, but no circulatory system. Their body is uh, simple enough where they don't need a circulatory system. They don't need a real excretory system. They're just going to eliminate their stuff directly into the water from their tissues uh, themselves. Uh, there's no concentrated nervous system, so there's no brain there, but they do have a network of nerve cells. And those nerve cells do respond to touch, uh, gravity, and, and light as well. Um, they capture prey with special uh, cells uh, that have organelles called nematocysts. Those nematocysts have a little harpoon-like structure that gets triggered and uh, even uh, injecting venom into the prey to paralyze. So these nematocysts, which are, they're found in cells called nidocytes. Though they'll also refer to nidocytes as nematocytes. Site means cell, but the cyst is an organelle within this cell. So if you see nidocyte, which is kind of like their name there, which is unique for the phylum, or nematocyte. Uh, and this is a big defining feature for this group. So what defines these groups is the nidocyte or the nematocyte. And so there's their position there. They have two basic body forms, the familiar medusa, which is like a jellyfish here, and then there's the polyp form. Okay. And the polyp form uh, is sessile, though some are capable of moving uh, a little bit of ways there. Uh, but you can see they have some of the same uh, things that we're going to be seeing here. They're going to have epidermis and gastrodermis uh, lining their gut. They're going to have what's called a gastrovascular cavity, or GVC. But I ask you in a lab exam, uh, what that structure is, the cavity where they feed it's colored purple here in both. Uh, they're going to only have one opening to mouth. But I've asked for the name of the structure. I want to know if, if you would know the entire name. So I'd be asking you really to name the entire thing rather than just abbreviating it uh, for me. So I'll be looking for the name gastrovascular cavity. So the jellyfish like of, uh, body form is medusa and then polyp. And so. Um, Again, they're going to have a single opening in their mouth, and they're going to have that gastrovascular cavity where they take food in to digest. Uh, the gastrovascular cavity can also be used to help exchange uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen. Their, their cells are going to need oxygen. They can discharge waste from there, and when their gametes are formed, it's associated with the gastrovascular cavity as well. Again, two layers. Uh, that develop from ectoderm and endoderm. The ectoderm is going to form the epidermis on the outside, and the endoderm forms the gastrodermis on the inside. And then what gives them their name is this mesoglia, this jelly-like uh, or gelatinous matrix that forms inside and between the two walls. And there's even more of that in the medusa. The medusa has even more of what we call uh, that mesoglia there. So you see, whether you're polyp or medusa, you have that one opening in the mouth. You have the gastrovascular cavity. Uh, and then you're going to have these tentacles that surround the mouth, those tentacles, that are going to have those nidocytes or nematocytes. So be familiar that uh, the notes here say uh, uh, nematocyte. The main thing is that it's the same cell, and both, whether you're a nidocyte or nematocyte, you're going to have that organelle called the nematocyst, which is the stinging uh, organelle. And so um, support for their body is going to be with their gastrovascular cavity. Their body is relatively uh, soft overall. 
uh, but that gastrovascular cavity can actually provide uh, uh, hold water within it and then that water provides a force or a pressure against the wall and when that's the case then that's called a hydrostatic skeleton when the fluid provides a, a, a force uh, it's called hydrostatic uh, pressure it's on the walls there uh, if you're interested, you download this, this video. Uh, talks about corals that they keep in a, a tank and how they feed. Because corals uh, are going to actually produce a skeleton on the outside of their body, an exoskeleton. And it may be uh, uh, some uh, uh, of these uh, cnidarians produce an exoskeleton of chitin, but some do uh, calcium carbonate, like the corals that they're showing. Uh, they're feeding corals right now in that video. Um, so uh, some are, are soft and use a hydrostatic skeleton. Some have uh, produced an exoskeleton there uh, overall. And skeletons help provide shape uh, or, or uh, support for the body, for the mass of the cells that make up the animal. So the cnidarians do go through life cycle. And uh, some cnidarians will only form a polyp. And that's their entire, um, they stay in that. Uh, body form. Uh, and if that's the case, they're going to reproduce, they can reproduce, se all the cnidarians can reproduce sexually or asexually. Uh, and if they stay as a polyp, then they have to have produced sperm and egg from the polyp stage. Some are only as medusa, medusae is plural, uh, with an e at the end. And some alternate between medusa and polyp. Now, if they alternate between medusa and polyp, then it's usually the medusa that's going to be producing the sperm and the egg. Okay. Now, if you alternate between polyp and medusa, you're diploid, all of your cells. Okay. So they have to go through meiosis to produce sperm and egg. This was different than the plants. The plants, the gametophyte was already haploid, and they produced their gametes by mitosis and differentiation here. Here you have a colony of polyps, and some are feeding polyps. polyps. This is a, uh, a, a type of uh, cnidarian that belongs to the genus Obelia. And so I'm going to underline that. So this is a colony. They grow in colonies. And you can see that gastrovascular cavity is covered in blue and it's interconnected in this colony here. And you're going to have feeding polyps and then you're going to have reproductive polyps that reproduce the, or that produce uh, medusa by budding. It's asexual reproduction. So genetically, the medusa that are produced uh, just through different cell differentiation and development are get released from these um, 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 reproductive medusae, and then you have uh, uh, reproductive polyps, and then the other polyps are feeding polyps overall. So when the medusae get released, uh, those are the ones that are going to, because this alternates between medusa and uh, polyp stage, it's the medusa that would produce sperm and egg. Uh, sperm fertilizes the egg. In this case, remember the, the blastula is the hollow sphere, and then that blastula develops into a free-living uh, planula, which is the name of the larva. If we're going to alternate between medusa and polyp, the planula uh, larva then will go and settle and go through metamorphosis and then grow a new colony of polyps. And so we repeat the cycle. So this is a life cycle where we alternate. We're going to go through a polyp and a medusa stage. And when you do that, it's the medusa that, that uh, reproduce sexually. Now, for these cnidarians, they're going to a coric, and that means you're going to have separate male and female uh, animals. So the sexes are separate. Uh, and when the polyps produce the medusa, that's, uh, that's it's a form of reproduction called asexual uh, or asexual reproduction uh, overall. So uh, I didn't read through the slide. I just went ahead and explained uh, a, a life cycle for a group of cnidarians that has both polyp and medusa. Again, some just have polyp, so we'll, we'll talk about those that do. For digestion, this is a major innovation here evolutionarily in that at, uh, food is taken into a cavity where digestion takes place extracellularly. So that means that those cells that line the cavity are releasing digestive enzymes that start to break down the food. Uh, so extracellular digestion within the gastrovascular cavity, and then the cells are going to engulf the particles by phagocytosis and then finish uh, with cellular digestion. 
Uh, I mentioned the nematocyst earlier as the special organelle that's found, uh, especially within the tentacles. They're used to capture prey. Uh, they sting the, the, uh, their food. It might be some smaller invertebrate animal they capture, and then they can bring that food into the mouth and then into the, the digestive cavity. Here you can see a polyp. This is in the genus Hydra. The Hydra, those that are in that genus, Hydra species, they don't produce Medusa. So uh, they're going to, instead, instead of reproducing asexually by producing Medusae, uh, they do, they just basically butt off uh, a whole other polyp off of there. Then they will also grow uh, within their walls of their body, either ovary or, or uh, testes to produce sperm or egg. So they reproduce sexually, asexually. They just don't form uh, a medusa. Uh, as I said earlier, some only in polyp stage, that's hydra, some only as medusa, and some go to both. The name of the organelle is called a nematocyte. Uh, uh, or the, the, the cell, remember so the mouse, the site means cell. Uh, the nematocyte has an organelle called a nematocyte. So the, here they show within the epidermis, some of the cells differentiate to form these uh, special cells. So there's looking at one of the cells more closely within there is that organelle, that's, that's the stinging organelle for the stinging cell. It's called a nematocyst in there. And here the, uh, the nematocyst hasn't been discharged. This is what it looks like when it discharges here. And here's that little harpoon-like structure there. And this can deliver venom into its prey, which either paralyzes or kills the, the animal with the venom. So there are some classes of cnidaria. You won't look at them all in the laboratory, and you'll look at them in more detail at these uh, groups here. So what you do in the lab is going to supplement what you're doing here. So the lab uh, that's supposed to be done uh, today is covering uh, both peripherans and the cnidarians. And so you're going to look at these classes as well. So when you look at when we look at the classification, the domain is eukarya. We shouldn't get that wrong anytime you're asked because we're looking at eukaryotes. Uh, the supergroup would be opistocanta, the same as the fungi, but it's not a formal taxon. That's just a, a group where we're trying to put different eukaryotes uh, in their clades where they share common ancestry. So the supergroup is opistocanta. We're going on with the classification. This is the kingdom animalia. And I should have done this with the sponges. Where the sponge is there in the phylum periphera. And when we saw that cladogram that showed the different phyla, which an assumption would be that if you're in that phylum, you're uh, monophyletic and you share a common ancestry with those in your group. Here now we're in the phylum cnidaria, not in the phylum periphera. And the next uh, level or rank below this, where we separate phyla into subgroups, that's the class. So here we're looking at the different classes. So the first class we're looking at here in the notes is the class Anthozoa. The Anthozoa are the sea anemones, corals, and sea fans. And this is the sea anemone here, like the one I tried to draw earlier. And these are polyps of the coral that produce the exoskeleton. Uh, and then others. Now these, they may be solitary like the sea anemone or grow in colonies like a coral. Uh, their gastrovascular cavity is more complex. It's divided into compartments. It's not just one sac, uh, uh, gut-like sac. Those uh, compartments are separated by membranes called mesenteries. Their tentacles are hollow, and some of them live symbiotically uh, with algae called zooxanthellae, which can do photosynthesis and actually provide uh, nourishment for the animal. Um, and these guys here, the anthozoans, only boy, I can't spell here. Only polyp form. They don't produce medusa. So that's in there. It's not on the slides. So you want to add that to these notes here. Uh, when it comes to corals, the coral reefs are actually important economically because the coral reefs reefs are nurseries for a lot of other uh, organisms, including fish, many fish that we might eat. As well, and the coral reefs may attract uh, ecotourism, so that can bring money into an area. But for in terms of food, providing food from fish, uh, so these uh, the symbionts that they live with are an algae that do photosynthesis. So that's the uh, class Anthozoa. 
Again, all of these are classes in the phylum Nectaria, and you do need to know this taxonomy for, especially for the laboratory. But then if I ask you in words with questions for about these groups, I might use these terms. So you've got to be familiar with them for both lab and lecture. It's just in the lab, you actually have to type them out on exams. The class Cubozoa, these are called box jellies. Here's a box jelly here. They kind of look uh, cube-shaped overall. You can see the tentacles out here toward the end of do have, uh, stinging those, those uh, niocytes or nematocytes. These are strong uh, swimmers. They're uh, great predators. Uh, and some of them have very, very potent venom that can kill uh, even in very small amounts. So there's a box jelly that's found along the coastal areas of uh, Australia. Uh, and their very, very small amount of venom is enough to kill many, many men. Uh, and then the hydrozoa. These hydrozoa uh, are actually can will show both polyp and uh, uh, medusa. The the uh, cubozoa is only only medusa form. The hydrozoa is both, but uh, the polyp is the more dominant uh, uh, type rather than the medusa. Uh, so again, they're both polyp and medusa. The medusa are going to be very small. So that obelia life cycle I showed you earlier, the medusa are very, very tiny there. This is the only class that's going to have freshwater members in there. And here is a Portuguese man of war. Uh, it's actually a colony of polyps. And you can see the tentacles hanging down from that colony. And some of the colony produces a structure that carries air. It's called a pneumato. Pneumato means air. You see that in the disease called pneumonia. Uh, nematophore, which means a uh, structure that carries air, or at means to carry, so it's nematophore. So this is a Portuguese man where you may have seen one wash up uh, at the island, or if you've been out in the water on the boat, you might have seen, you might have seen floating around. Your tentacles hang down to capture, which thing and capture a uh, prey. Then you have the Scythozoa. The Scythozoa do have both polyp, uh, so they do both polyp and uh, medusa. But the medusa is very uh, complex uh, structure uh, overall, so the medusa seems to be the more dominant uh, stage. So they do go through medusa and polyp uh, forms uh, overall. Uh, and some medusa can be pretty, pretty big, and some are not very big at all, but overall the medusa is much more complex than the medusa and the hydrozoa. So this is the group that we commonly call the jellyfish. The medusa is more complex, uh, and uh, they're much better swimmers. And then here's uh, an odd one called the class Starozoa. These are the star jellies. Here's a picture here of a uh, Starozoa. They tend to be attached to some substrate um, overall. Uh, they do resemble the Medusa, um, but they're going to be connect, connected to some substrate by a short stalk, uh, uh, so they don't move around very much. This last section of the chapter starts uh, coverage of the bilateria. These are the animals that develop from um, three germ layers. Uh, they're characterized by having the bilateral symmetry. So let's take a look at the objectives here is to list the distinguishing features of bilateria and then understand the phylogeny of the major groups of bilateria, which is going to be everything to the right of this point here. Uh, and they include, again, the protostomes and the deuterostomes and uh, this group that we're going to cover here, uh, the acela. Uh, and so with bilateral symmetry, uh, we have high levels of specialization here. Again, two clades, two major groups, the protostomes and uh, deuterostomes and the other group, which is the acela. Basically, that's a split right here where a proposed common ancestor would be. And essentially, this splits into uh, the, the group that never developed a body cavity and those that developed a coelom, and then some went through losses of coelom afterwards, a reversal of evolutionary. So uh, in this one, we're going to look at the phylum uh, acela, and, and it's a very short section here. So for the phylum acela, there's a picture of uh, Wamed. Noah, looks like how you pronounce that genus. It's an acial flatworm is what they're commonly called. There's another group of flatworms called the phylum platyhelminthes, which are protostomes. 
and they do resemble them. And they were actually thought to be a basal member, which means a very, very primitive uh, relative uh, sharing ancestry with the phylum platyhelminthes. Uh, but uh, the molecular evidence shows that the fact that they don't have a body cavity has to do with convergent evolution. In other words, there we had this group of acelomorphous split off earlier, and then you had the other group, the bilateria, that had a coelom, and then uh, over time, a group of animals lost that body cavity, and uh, you have this group, the phylum platyhelminthes. You're going back similarly, we were talking about examples of how a whale and a shark would have the same body form. They just arrive at that same shape independent of each other. When it comes to this group, they have a primitive nervous system and they lack a digestive cavity.